are up. Someone there? Yes, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> Hello, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. They they said I was the first one on there, so I've been on since since uh, 654. <laughs> 654, I guess you was then. <laughs> I think I'm number five. <laughs> According to what the, what, you know, what the computer said. <laughs> Oh, okay. We, I guess, All right. Yes. But I, I started, just waiting for the rest. I yeah. started to hang up because I don't like to be, be the first one. So I oh, can't. my goodness. It's well, always we, the we, time to be first. We don't want anyone to hang up. <laughs> well, I was going to call oh. back. I was going to call back. Right, right. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I tell you, it's 7 o'clock, and uh, we're going to begin and uh, all right welcome yeah. all of our visitors and guests who are joining us uh today for a very special program and okay. uh, i'm going to invite you to bow your heads but just before we do that we just want to let everyone know we are streaming on facebook uh at the same time we're streaming on zoom uh we're not able to connect with the youtube link but we are on zoom so we just want everyone to know that if you want to get the word out our uh youtube um link is it's not working right now but we are we will upload to youtube at, at a later time but at this time we want to just bow our heads as we begin our service father in heaven uh these are troublous times that we find ourselves in and tonight lord we're looking and expecting uh, you to do some great things, to meet the current emergency, to meet the current needs that uh, we have as your people, as your children, Lord. So we petition your throne for extraordinary grace to be bestowed upon us tonight, especially your speaker and those who are participating on the program tonight. So we ask in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. 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 Well, once again, we just wanna welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Pastor Stanley Dixon. I am the pastor of the Mount Carmel SDA Church. And I am also the assistant to the president of the Northeastern Conference uh, here in the great state of New York and not only New York, but Connecticut and, and Massachusetts. And so we just want to welcome everyone. And this Great. initiative that is sponsored by the Northeastern Conference of Seventh Day Adventists is something that uh, was uh, an initiative of an evangelistic uh, program that was started about a year ago. And we're continuing on the heels of that evangelistic program by featuring uh, different churches within the Western New York region and I am the assistant to the president for Western New York. And so it is in these areas and we have our various churches who are presenting programs, extending the theme, finding hope in the midst of a crisis. And no one can doubt that we are living in a crisis at this present time. And so every month, now this month, it is the Mount Carmel church who is presenting and we're usually presenting on the first Sunday of each month at 7 p.m. And so I just want to read uh, a list of uh, the churches. There's an outline that uh, we put out and uh, beginning at April, we started in January, but uh, April is Mount Carmel. And then May, we have the Triangle uh, Mission that will be giving uh, the program. And they're out of Whitney Point, New York. And then also in Western New York, the Breath of Life program uh, out of Rochester, will be giving their program first Sunday in June. And then in July, uh, Rochester Outreach Community Church, that is uh, better known as Rock, out of Rochester, New York, will be presenting in July. And then in August, Emmanuel Temple of Buffalo, New York, they will be hosting. In September, the Jefferson Avenue Church, uh, Rochester, New York. We just want to welcome our uh, Western New York um, Breath of Life pastor, Pastor Drisdell is on with us and we welcome him Amen. to our program Amen. tonight. Uh, and then in October, 
our friendship church out of Elmira Church will be presenting, and then Mount Carmel in Syracuse once again in November, December Triangle, and then in 2022 Breath of Life, and then Rock will present again in February. So we just want to welcome all of our Western New New York churches and for the great work that you have been doing. I also see, want to welcome Pastor Grissom who was on the line and he's out of Buffalo, New York and he will be presenting Amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, in upcoming months. And so we, we, we just want to thank our pastors and, and those who've already let out since January, Emmanuel Temple, Jefferson and Friendship. They have all been doing an excellent job. Uh, our pastor at, at Friendship uh, uh, was uh, presenting on, on March and a, a very powerful program. So we thank God for all of you. And then all of our visitors and all of our online guests, we just wanna welcome you because this is a very special topic that we want mm -hmm. to uh, present to, to, tonight. And I'm sure uh, there's much more to discuss, but we're just going to whet your appetite just a little bit and get some insight into how God uh, wants to direct his church in the midst of this kind of crisis. And our theme uh, for Mount Carmel is, is um, finding hope. Racism can't stop this. And so that's an interesting topic. What is the pastor going to speak about today? I will introduce the speaker in just a little minute, in just a moment, but at this time, I want to welcome Baraka Winters. He's our young person who is up and coming. Uh, God has gifted him. And we're gonna ask uh, Baraka Winters to read our scripture reading at this time. Baraka, you can go ahead and unmute and read our scripture reading for us tonight. Amen. Thank you. Um, the scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Okay. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth, plainly we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the lights of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Baraka, for our scripture reading. And at this time, we're going to introduce our special music uh, for this evening. And she is a member also of Mount Carmel. And her name is, I'm having a senior moment right now, Jackie Phipps. Jack, Jackie Phipps. And when I say that, I'm not kidding. Uh, Jackie Phipps is our uh, crown singer, and we were always blessed by, by her uh, inspirational uh, tongue. And, uh, and so at this time, we will present uh, Jackie as we prepare for the speaker. But you know, before I do that, let me introduce our, our speaker. Our speaker is Jonathan Dixon, I, I'm very proud to present him because he is my second born son. He is also a senior, uh, not a senior, but, but a graduating uh, seminarian at Andrews University. He was born in Lancaster, California and what would become a family of six. He's uh, uh, the son, as I mentioned, uh, of Pastor Stanley Dixon and his wife, Sheena Dixon. Uh, who diligent, diligently raised their four sons, heeding the counsels given uh, in the Bible, uh, the seven-day church as taught through the Bible, and Ellen G. White. Books such as Education in the Adventist Home and Ministry of Healing informed them of the practices such as family devotion, homeschooling, and practical service. As best they could, they raised their sons on a plant-based diet with the opportunity to experience the limitless, limitless joys of Christian fellowship 
nature, music, and the study of God's word. And it is with this upbringing that Jonathan Dixon has moved forward through his life. He has received the opportunity to live in California, Arizona, North Carolina, Hawaii, and presently in New York with his family. After graduating from Pine Forge Academy and completing one year of schooling at Oakwood University, he discerned that God was calling him to missionary service. The mission experience transformed his Christian experience into being one of self-sacrifice for the good and salvation of others. This purpose has persisted with him in his matriculation through and beyond college. He attended Oakwood University for three years. He is a graduate of Atlantic Union College. Currently, he serves as a sponsored student at Andrews University Theological Seminary in Berrien Springs, Michigan. After completing the Master of Divinity program, he hopes to return to the Northeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists who, who has sponsored him to the seminary to begin his pastoral ministry there. And Jonathan will be graduating uh, this uh, July, this summer. He is happily married to his beautiful wife, Courtney. And we are thankful that Courtney will be giving us the appeal song uh, following uh, the message that he brings today. And so at this time to prepare us for that word, we have Sister Jackie Phipps who will bring us our special music number of meditation. Amen. Soon will be done trouble Troubles of the world, troubles of this world, soon I will be done. Troubles of the world, going home to leave.
going home to live with God. Amen. 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 Um, hold on one second. Uh -oh. All right. Pardon, pardon. Um, we you know, sometimes videos follow one another, and we have no control over what happens uh, right after that. But uh, I want to just uh, start right back again. So at this time, we're going to ask uh, Pastor Jonathan if you could uh, go ahead and unmute. And the time is yours, sir. All right. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dad. Um, it is a, a privilege to be able to speak on the topic that we are addressing tonight. Um, I want to say, just as someone put in the chat, that was amazing, Sister Phipps. That was beautiful. And um, it was very encouraging to hear that spiritual, to hear the, the pathos that has so long identified the African-American people. Um, the, the desire to, to see a time when we are beyond suffering, beyond mistreatment, beyond um, cruelty. Today, we're going to be talking about the reality of racism. Now, this reality, as an African-American and as a young man, I can say that I have witnessed this entity. I've witnessed racism, I've witnessed bigotry, I've witnessed, witnessed um, stereotyping. When someone treats you incorrectly when they don't even know the content of your character. I've experienced that, I've witnessed that for myself. But brothers and sisters, as a Christian also, I have witnessed a power that is even greater than the, than the, the shortcomings of man, even greater than the, the evil of man, I have been able to witness the goodness of God as it is visible in Christ. And that is the main focus that we're going to be looking at tonight. It is the reality that racism on the part of man cannot stop the mission of Christ. Racism cannot stop the mission of Christ. I want to start by telling you my own personal experience with witnessing both entities at work, but seeing that God is greater than even the wickedness of man. Before we go into this, I just wanna say one more word of prayer. So I invite you all to please bow your heads with me as we go forward. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for the, the opportunity to live with courage, Lord. Even David, when he was on the run from Saul, still had a refuge. He still had a place of solace. He still had an anchor for his faith, Lord. And we as people on this earth, despite the blight of sin and the infection of, of selfishness, Lord, we have been given an anchor for the soul. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will come down and anchor everyone who hears this message, whether they be young or old, experienced, or just coming into this reality, Lord, I pray that you will give them hope that is something worthy to fight for, something that is worthy to, to strive, to maintain, to hold on to in these times. Thank you, Lord, is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 2016, I went on a I, I went on a drive. My destination was Orlando, Florida. I was coming from Huntsville, Alabama. Two of my, actually four of my friends, two couples were getting married on the same day. Now, if that's not a reason to, to travel to a wedding, I don't know what is, but we decided that we were gonna go to both of our friends' weddings. Um, when I say we, it was a, a collection of carpooling vans. A carpooling cars and vans. Um, we were all going to head down from Oakwood University to go meet up with our friends and support them in the wedding. 
So this was a nine hour trip. I remember we, we started off in the evening, we drove four hours to Atlanta, then we stopped and rested, and then we continued the rest of the way in the morning, early in the morning. And we got there um, reasonably, probably a, a few couple hours before lunch. But nevertheless, we were, before I stepped foot out of that vehicle, I said a prayer. I said a prayer and my prayer was simply, Lord, guide my steps and use me in ministry today. Lord, guide my steps and use me in ministry today. And with that, I stepped out of the vehicle. When I got to the vehicle, there were many other friends, probably I could say about 40 at least that I was aware of outside of the, the, um, the workers that were helping to set up the, um, the wedding event. But amongst those people, I noticed one individual who I could tell was not part of our group. I had never seen him before. Um, and it didn't seem to be that he felt comfortable where he was. It was a Hispanic young man. Um, but I remembered, and I didn't even have to think about it too much. That was my mission. I wanted to be involved in ministry that day. And so when I saw that young man, I began walking toward him because I, I knew that he was some, it was a divine appointment. God wanted me to, to interact with that young man. And as I was heading to him, another young man from our group, um, in, he ended up interacting with that person as well. His name was Tyler. And so as Tyler's talking to, talking to this gentleman, I end up coming up and joining them in this conversation. And while Tyler's primarily the one speaking, I'm thinking in my head, um, Lord, what would you have me to say to this young man? But as I'm praying that in my head, I get an impression, I get an impression to, to leave the conversation. Now, typically, on any average person, when they get an impression, the first thought is, is this a psychological issue? Why am I having, why, why am I getting this issue? Where, uh, why am I getting this impression? Where is this coming from? But I had a lot of experience with listening to the Holy Spirit. After being involved in canvassing and visiting, doing ministry in, in the Section 8 housing, low-income community, and going to juvenile detention centers, I was familiar with that voice. I knew when God was telling me to do something. And when God tells you to do something, he's always thinking about saving souls. He's always thinking about saving souls. And I knew that. And so this impression came to me, encouraging me to, to leave the conversation and go job. Now that was, that was very, you know, I almost could say it was unexpected. Why would, why would God tell me that? So unfortunately, because I, I was, I didn't want to listen. I, I resisted for a little bit. I'm like, no, that's too crazy. That's, that's just out of it. But the impression came two more times. And after the third time, I had to just accept it. Like, this is, this is something serious. And so I excused myself from the conversation. And I, um, I told one other individual, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go jog. Um, and it was a resort. It was a resort in Orlando, Florida. And so I began to go on this jog. And as I'm jogging, I stay by the main road. I stay by the main road. And as I'm jogging down, um, down the, the entry way, I see a police SUV drive in. And so we're passing each other. And as I've shared this before, I know Mount Carmel and several other churches may have been, heard me share this message, um, but I repeat it because it is applicable to this time. But I, my parents had raised me to always act with integrity when you are interacting with the police. You do not speak with slander. You do not try to show slight, but instead you show respect because those who show respect are, it is expected that they will be respected. And so I, I made sure I made eye contact with the police officer. I waved and he, he nodded. I saw him nod. We made eye contact and he continued on that way. And so with that, I kept um, jogging. I kept jogging and Shortly after seeing, after that interaction, I see the same SUV drive out the entryway. 
Now I noticed that something was strange about that. Why, why would he come in just to go out? So I noticed that, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think too deeply about it. But I kept jogging and eventually I came to a portion of the resort that had a banyan tree. Uh, now, because my family was able to live in Hawaii for some time, I was very familiar with the banyan tree. The banyan tree has these vines that don't snap like the wild grapevine, but they're actually strong enough for you to swing on. And I would just, as I stood next to this banyan tree and I was looking up at it, I just began reminiscing of so many experiences my brothers and I had in Hawaii, swinging on the banyan tree over rivers. And, you know, it was, we had an amazing time. And so as I'm reminiscing, just looking up at this tree, I hear a vehicle come up behind me in the grass. And something told me off the back that this is a police officer. This is the same individual. So I turn around and sure enough, it's the same police SUV. Now I had already greeted him the first time. And so I, I, I had a clear conscience. I didn't have any guilt. And so I decided to, to approach the police, the, the police car. Instead of just standing where I was under the tree, I came out of the tree toward the front of the vehicle. When the police officer came out, I said, sir, is there anything I can help you with? He ignored my question and told me, put your hands on the hood of the car. Now, because I had a clear conscience and because I was confident that this, this situation would de-escalate, I, I obeyed. I went to the front of the car, I put my hands on the hood and I asked the officer one more time, excuse me, sir, uh, may I ask, why are you, uh, what's going on? Why are you doing this? He ignored my question again. I didn't get an answer. He came behind me and um, he told me to interlock my fingers behind my head. Now I couldn't even picture what that looked like just because I had never heard someone ask me to do that before. And so I hesitated for a second. I'm like, interlock my fingers behind my head. And then he, he grabbed my hands and he pushed my hands behind my head like this. And, you know, then I was like, oh, interlock your fingers behind your head. Okay, yes. And so he had me in that position. And then he went about to pat me down. Now, once, as I've, I've shared this in the past, my, my parents, my dad, I think particularly, because he was raising four sons, he took it serious. And he told us there's, some, there's certain ways men don't touch men. There's some, certain ways men don't touch boys. Boys don't touch boys. There, there's, there's limitations. So my dad raised me with that mentality. So when he put his hand on my thigh, instantly my hand went down and it knocked his hand away. Now that caused the police officer to go berserk. And he pushed me against the, the hood of the vehicle and he took my, he put my hands behind me and put me in handcuffs. Now, I stayed calm and I, or he started, you know, asking me, why did you retaliate? Why did you retaliate? And I spoke back calmly. I said, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know you were going to touch me. And it's just a natural reaction when someone touches you and you don't know it, you retaliate. And, um, or you respond. So I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting that. But nevertheless, so here I was now on the hood of a police car with my hands in handcuffs, and I don't know why. Now, something began to well up within me, and I can tell you the first feeling I had was not anger per se. It was confusion. It was confusion because I wasn't sure why what was happening was happening. I couldn't understand what happened and my confusion did begin to turn into some anger. But surprisingly, my anger was not geared at the police officer. My anger, because I was a Christian and I am a Christian, my anger began to head toward God. I started to wonder, Lord, why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? Where did I, where did I go wrong? Where did I where did I ignore your voice? Where did I sin? How did I end up in this unfortunate predicament? And I'm sure many of you have, have felt experiences like this. And I guess I'll just ask the question, have you ever been in a, in a circumstance that you feel you did not merit 
you did not deserve to be put in the position that you were in? Have you ever felt like you were wronged without a cause? Have you ever felt like someone was doing you an injustice that you did not incur, that it was not reasonable for them to do to you? If you had these experiences, which I know we have had these experiences, then you can relate to how I felt in that moment. You can relate to the anxiety of, of not knowing what's gonna happen in your immediate future, not knowing whether you're going to be taken care of or you're going to be taken advantage of. You can relate to this. But I tell you, as I was going through that experience, I began to fish through my mind for an anchor on which to place my faith. And the one thing I could remember since that morning, the one thing that I found as an anchor was I remembered that before I stepped foot out of that vehicle, I had prayed. And my prayer was, Lord, lead me in or lead my steps and use me in ministry today. I had prayed that prayer. And I remember the promise of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that says, if my people will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear and forgive their sins and heal their land. I remember that God says that if we pray, he will hear. Now, some can take that verse, you could take that verse and just um, try to dis dissect it and say, maybe it doesn't apply to me directly. Maybe, how can I claim that? But what we have to do when we encounter God's word is put it to practical faith. Don't let God's word just be an, an entity that you, don't, uh, that you don't claim as relevant to yourself. These scriptures that God has given, he says that these words are profitable in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. They, they are profitable for instruction, for reproof. They are, are applicable to the human condition, applicable to the problems that we go through. And so when I thought about that, I'm saying, so that text says, if I pray, God will answer. And if I'm sincere, I'm not seeking to remain in sin. I'm not seeking to uh, I'm not seeking to turn away from God, but I'm, I prayed with an intention to draw near to God. So if I prayed, that means that God answered. And if I prayed for God to lead my steps, then if this is where I stand at this moment, then that means God led me here. And if I prayed to be used in ministry today, then that means that the only person or I should say, and the only person that was around me was that police officer, then that meant that God placed me there to minister to the police officer. It was not a mistake. It was a divine appointment. And so as I'm on the hood of the car with the handcuffs and I come to that reality that God is at work and that God is greater than men, that God can work in me in such a powerful way that it can turn the tides of whatever even may be at work in that police officer. Once I got the understanding that I was in ministry at that moment, then I began to have peace. Then I began to think a little bit more actively. And I started thinking, all right, I, I thought about the Miranda rights. You know, you have the, the right to remain silent. And I thought, well, technically, that's, that also is implying that I have the right to speak. I have the right to speak. So I thought, what can I say? And I began to think of testimonies. I began to think of testimonies that I experienced when I was, in, uh, when I was doing um, ministry with NAPS, mission work. And one of the, I shared three testimonies, but one of them that I shared was regarding the experience that I had when I... Um, when I went to the juvenile detention center for the first time, I went to a juvenile detention center for the first time. And I shared with the cop, you know, I started by saying, you know, I'm here because um, I'm here for a wedding and my friends are in a missionary group. And, and that's how I began to share the testimonies. Um, but I shared with him that I was afraid. The first time I went in a, in a juvenile detention center, they told us that we were in the, the section that had the rapists and the murderers. 
And I was like, and there's no like bodyguards. We, we don't have any, we're just gonna go right into them. You know, I remember I was worried. I was worried, but I said a prayer and I shared with them that I said, I said a prayer and I was praying, Lord, help this to be a good experience and help me to connect with someone well. And so the program went on at the juvenile detention, detention center at the end, uh, it's typical for our group in NAPS to mingle, to interact. And so the time came for me to go and walk up to uh, one of the inmates. And the first person I talked to, I was like, hey, my name is Jonathan. And the guy was like, hey, my name is Jonathan too. And immediately I recognized that that was special. And this young man recognized that it was special. And he, he we both ended up having a really great conversation. And at the end, we prayed. But I began sharing this experience with, with the police officer. And I started sharing with them that if young people would exercise their faith and actually do something with their faith, they can change the world. They can change hearts. And I was telling him that I've seen that for myself. And so I kept that focus. Um, and I just shared, I, like I said, I shared two more testimonies. And by the time I finished the third testimony, the police officer raised me off of the hood of the car and he took his glasses off. He had these black sunglasses. He took them off and it almost looked like he was sweating. And he said, look, I know you're innocent. I know you're innocent, but a helicopter saw you jogging and they told me that I have to stop you. I told them that, you, that I saw you and I didn't think you were a suspect, but I had, they told me that I needed to stop you. That's why I stopped you. And I told him, sir, it's all right. And he told me that he, he couldn't let me go until the, a second cop came to verify that I was not the suspect that they were looking for. Because apparently someone had robbed a nearby suburb or nearby, air, nearby neighborhood, um, nearby the resort that we were at. And apparently the suspect ran to the resort. And so he said that they, they needed to verify that I was not that suspect. And I stayed calm. Um, you know, I told him it's okay, it's okay. I don't mind waiting. That's a joint uh, video. Why are we not seeing it? I beg your pardon. Let's see. I'm gonna keep it, going. It's okay. It's it's okay. We're we're asking everyone to move. You can go right ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. No problem. So the second cop came. The second cop came. He got out of his his car. And he didn't even walk. Um, he didn't even walk up to me. He just, from a distance, I guess I saw him call the police officer. The the first police officer came, and I just saw the second one just shaking his head like that's not the suspect. That's not the suspect. And eventually, the second cop left. And the first cop now he turns around and he begins walking toward me. And this is a Caucasian male, a Caucasian man, probably about. 50, 45 or 50. And this man begins to blush and I can see it. And I, I don't say that just to, to acknowledge it, but you could tell that he was having, anxiety was developing in him. And I mentioned the sweat before, but this time I could really see a lot of sweat. And, I, and he came up to me and he began, he just started talking almost um, out of out of like a, a frenzy in a bit. He was like, this is not a race thing. And I'm sorry, you know, because this happened just two years after the Eric Gardner situation and four years after the Trayvon Martin case. And it was during, during that time, the, the I Can't Breathe protests were actually still going on in certain areas. And so he was, it was at the heat of it. And he was, he was very, very anxious. And I told him, sir, it's okay, it's okay. And, um, you know, eventually, um, I, you know, after we, we exchanged some things, I just asked him, sir, would you mind if I said a word of prayer with you? And to my surprise, he actually said, yes, yes, I, I, would, I would appreciate that. And I still remember his name, but I said that prayer with him. And at the end of the prayer, he was like, you can go anywhere on this resort. Feel free to go anywhere. And I, I did not zone in on that. I, you know, I, I might have said, ha ha, but I went straight back to the resort. I was like, I'm not jogging anywhere <laughs> in this place anymore. So I went back. The first person I showed was my, my wife now, but my girlfriend at that time. And I, we took pictures of the handcuff prints 
in uh, that were left in my wrist from that experience. Now I share all this, I share all this to show that that was a situation that could have gone a different way. It could have been that I threw a fit and instead of shooting up a prayer, I could have shot out my fist. I could have responded in a way that might have made the situation worse and might have made my innocence a little bit harder for someone else to be able to discern. But because I chose to remain under the, the influence of the Holy Spirit, to remain in the mindset of ministry, that was not the case. Instead, that opportunity, that innocence was able to be used as an arsenal for ministry. And that is what we have to keep in mind, that as, that as Blacks, and I'm sure there are more people on this, this um, meeting, not, there's more ethnicities present. And so please take this applicable to, to, to all. But I'll speak directly to Blacks because that is my ethnicity. But we as Blacks must remember that no amount of evil will ever overcome evil. Evil cannot cast out evil. Just as Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot cast out darkness. If I took a bat to the dark, it wouldn't make it light. Only light can cast out darkness. The question then is, where do we get the light? Where does this light come from? Now, one of the beautiful things about light is that it's in light that we see color. It's actually why it's possible for us to discern one color from another is because of the light. But there are some people who say that they don't see color. But color makes a big difference. For example, there was a movie that came out a long time ago. Many of you will remember it. It's called The Wizard of Oz. And one of the, one of the, the key cinematic um, realities that this movie takes, takes advantage of is that they start the movie with Dorothy kind of in a black and white, old fashioned filter. And all you see is just, you don't see any color, colors, you just see different shades. But it's not until a tornado comes and, and picks up the house and, and, and ends up transporting Dorothy to a different land that they change the cinema, cinemographic um, filter and they begin to show you color. And so the color now, when, when you hear about the yellow brick road, you know it's actually yellow. When you, when you look at the emerald city, you know that it's green because you can see it. All the way down to the end of the movie when, when Dorothy clicks her ruby red slippers, you're able to see it. The color adds dimension. It, it helps the message that, the, that the, the director is trying to get across. It helps it to be more understood, more visible. And in our world today, we have a problem with color. We have a problem with color, but I wanna present that the problem that we have with color is that we don't know the mission of color. We don't know the purpose of color. What I wanna share with you all is that God is the one who designed the different ethnicities. He is the designer. He is the director, if we would say. He is the one who decides what color will be the yellow brick road, what color will be the Emerald City and bringing it back to our reality. He is the one who decided to have a multipl multiplicity of ethnicities and nationalities. But there still is a purpose, a mission for these ethnicities that needs to be understood. And this reality is understood in the scripture that we're gonna be looking at. This reality is found in 2 Corinthians, chapter four, and as it was read, I'm just gonna point us to verse five. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse five. Now this passage is Paul speaking 
And he's giving the encouragement to a group of people who need to understand that you should not grow weary in well-doing. As a matter of fact, verse one starts by saying, thank you, seeing that we have this ministry, as we, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We have a mission, but what is that mission? And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Now notice what, what Paul says. As a matter of fact, I will start, by, start at verse 3. This is what Paul says, speaking to these individuals who need to understand their mission. He says, but if our gospel be hid, that means if it is not visible, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to who? It is hid to them that are lost. We're going to come back to that. Verse four, in whom the God of this world, speaking of Satan, as it is a lowercase g the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, should shine unto them. Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, we, but Christ Jesus the Lord. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus. We're told in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, that God created man for his glory. And we are told in this verse that the, the image of God, the glory of God, is seen in the character of Jesus Christ. It is by presenting Christ to the world that we present the gospel to the world. It is by presenting Christ to the world that we present a light that is powerful enough to resist and, co and contradict darkness. It says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ. This is the mission of color. This is the mission of the human race. Our identity is found in the mission of revealing Christ to the world. Furthermore, our identity is found in Christ. And it is not until we can identify with Christ, identify with his mission, it is only when we can come to that point that we can be a force in overcoming racism, a force in overcoming narcissism, selfishness, alcoholism, all these traits of, of self-destruction and, and selfishness, all of those find their antidote and their resistance they find, we find the victory to overcome these things in Christ alone. Now, I want to point once again back to verse three. It says, but if our gospel be hid, if it's not visible, what does it say? It is hid to them that are lost. That means that if the gospel is hid, it is hid to the very people who need it most. It is hid to the people that need it most. And do you know who need the gospel of Christ the most? It is the racist. It is the persecutor. It is the adulterer, the harlot. It is those who are steeped in sin that need Christ the most. And if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them. How shall they overcome is the question we must ask. How shall they overcome if our gospel, if the knowledge of Christ's character, if the knowledge of his meekness, his gentleness, his long suffering, his patience, if his fruit of the spirit are lost, how in the world? I mean, if, if those are not visible, how in the world can, the, can, can anyone be changed? And as the previous chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we see that by beholding we become changed. But if we are, if people are not given the opportunity to behold the character of Christ, how, the, how shall they be changed to be like him? How shall the racist become meek like Jesus? 
how shall the racist become like the God of the Old and the New Testament that says he is no respecter of persons? How shall they become like that if they don't behold it in someone? Now, I want to just address something that is prevalent in our society today. Many people enjoy entertaining the thought that Jesus is the white man's God. That's the thought that people have. But I want to present that the reason why people think that Jesus is the white man's God is because they haven't seen Christ in color yet. They haven't seen Jesus in color. Once again, God is looking to use our ethnicity to bring the gospel of Christ to the world with even greater strength. And just to speak more on that topic of why Jesus is not the white man's God, Jesus was not born in Portugal. Jesus was not born in Europe. Jesus was born in Palestine. That was the area that God promised to Abraham before there was even a Jew. Yes, sir. It was a promise that God had given, and it was, it was a continuation of the promise given all the way back in the book of Genesis. Genesis 3.15, when we are told that someone would come and crush the evil that entered through the serpent, someone would step and bruise the head of the serpent, and that individual was, was Jesus Christ. And even just referring finally back to Abraham, Jesus says in John chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is bigger than the human race, but in his mercy and for a mission, yeah. Jesus has acquainted himself with the human race. And it is our privilege to reveal Jesus Christ in color to the world. No more black and white, but rather we are seeking a higher mission, not to preach ourselves, but to preach Jesus Christ to the world, not just in word, but in deed. This is the mission that we have. And I want to just move toward my close by presenting that with this mission, racism, racism and narcissism, everything on that spectrum, prejudice, bigotry, everything. But I summarize it all simply today by saying racism. Racism should not. Racism must not. Racism cannot stop Christ. And therefore, seeing we have received this ministry, we faint not. But as we're told in Philippians, we press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And further on, Paul says, for whom we have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that we may win Christ. We preach not ourselves, but we preach Christ. And the, the expression of Jesus Christ is what we find in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. We see that meekness is a trait of Christ, that gentleness is a trait of Christ, brotherly kindness is a trait of Christ. It is these traits, these are the traits that will cast out racism that will cast out darkness. And this is the ideology that propelled the civil rights movement under Martin Luther King in the, in the 1960s. It was understanding that darkness cannot cast out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot and will not cast out hate. Only love can do that. I wanna just conclude by sharing with you the, the closing of my experience. I shared with you all that I went back to the, I went back to the resort. I went to my, my girlfriend at the time and you know, I showed her my, you know, the imprints of my handcuffs. That was on a Friday, but on the following day, which was a Sabbath, I heard a group of my friends speaking and they told me, or they were speaking to each other and they said, did you hear? Somebody got arrested yesterday. And so I kind of felt a little bit of shame, but I didn't hear my name. So I kind of just stepped close to the conversation just to kind of hear what they're talking about. What did they hear? And as they're talking, I hear them say, yeah, it was the young man that Tyler was talking to. Apparently the young man confessed to Tyler that he was the culprit, that he had just robbed someone and he ran to the resort and he was trying to hide. And during that time frame, 
before the police officers were able to get to the man, Tyler, my friend, was able to give a Bible study to this young man using the story of Joseph. And he was telling him that Joseph went to prison, but he kept his honor. He was honest and truthful. And he told the young man, if you keep your, if you, if you're honest, turn yourself in. If you did the wrong, if you're honest, God will be with you in prison. He will deliver you. And so he told him he was able to share that with this young man. And apparently that when the police officers came, the young man willingly turned himself in. The police did not have to um, um, catch him or, or, or try to force him. But a nuance that I, that I am I'm amazed at is that by the time I got back to the resort, there were no police officers there. And the young man was gone. And what I take from that is that for the entire time that I was in handcuffs unjustly, God was at work in the life of the actual criminal, the actual person who was guilty. And because in God's eyes, he doesn't just see a criminal, he sees his child. And God is actively trying to save souls. And if you, as a righteous person, well, if, if, and of course, our righteousness is in Christ. But if you're in the moment where you are trusting God and evil besets you, trust that God knows that your faith can stand, but he's trying to build the faith of someone who, whose faith is weak. He is at work in someone else's life. So stay strong. Don't faint. Don't give up on your mission. Our mission is to reveal Jesus Christ under all circumstances racism or not, we preach Christ. This is our mission. Nothing should stop that. Racism cannot stop the mission of revealing Christ to the world. And so I conclude by simply asking you all to simply make the decision to surrender your fear and embrace faith. Surrender your, 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 your anger, which I know we all feel it. We're looking at these trials. We're seeing what's going on, the case that is going on right now. And, and there's a sense of justice, but I want to invite you to not use your, your sense of justice to, and use it for evil, but rather use it for good. Use it to re, use your life to reveal Jesus Christ, even to those who do you wrong. And this is the truth that is taught in Matthew chapter five. And so, brothers and sisters, the mission is to preach Christ. This is your mission, should you choose to accept it. Thank you for accepting Christ and accepting his mission. Let us, we're going to conclude with a song. And I pray that as this song is sung, you will invite the Holy Spirit to allow the tune of the, the message of Lord, I want to be a Christian. May that be your prayer and your mission. My wife is going to sing that. At this time. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. In to be a Christian in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus 
in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. In my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Amen. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Um, so Amen. now, um, I guess we will just say one more word of prayer um, to close out that. Is that all right? Yeah, go right ahead. I have some remarks when you finish. Go ahead. Okay. All right, all right. Let's let's just say one more word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we want to be Christians, Lord. It is tough, but Lord, it's not impossible. For all things are possible with you. I pray that you will give us the faith not to focus on our finite existence, not to focus on our on our weakness, but I pray that you give us the faith to trust in your infinite strength to know that while we exercise mercy, it is your prerogative and it is your intention to exercise judgment. Evil will not exist forever, Lord. And so, Lord, while we have the opportunity to coexist with the wicked, Lord, give us an influence over them for righteousness sake, Lord. May Christ be revealed in this world at this time, in our lifetimes, is our prayer. Help us, Lord, to see Christ and to be like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so Amen. much, uh, Jonathan Amen. and Courtney. Thank you for ministering to us in song. And we have been challenged tonight. And I heard this story in, in, a, in a whole new way. And um, we learned tonight that the mission of Christ cannot be stopped. It cannot be halted by racism or any other evil. And that only light can cast out darkness. And God has given us the mission of color. And it's so important that uh, I was greatly moved by the message and I trust that you were moved not only to just uh, be inspired, but also to act. And, and, and when those challenges come in your life, uh, that you will use the light that God has given you to cast out the darkness. And only in this way can lives be changed. And God is looking for us as his people to represent him no matter what color, no matter what race, and so that his mission can be completed and that we will all live together in heaven. Whatever our race, nationality, or creed, we will live together in heaven. And I don't know about you, but I have been inspired to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And only that power can cast out evil. Let us remember that. Let us embrace it. Let us hold on to it. Let us teach it to our children. And let us be witnesses, tangible witnesses, as Jonathan has experienced in his own life, to be able to witness Christ witness to be a witness for him, even when it seemed that he was done wrong and he was done wrong. But there were reasons for God was still working behind the scenes to actually convert someone else to the gospel 
while he was suffering. So all things work together for good. And so brothers and sisters, let us remember, let us be inspired. And I wanna thank, again, I wanna thank Jonathan, I wanna thank Courtney, and also wanna thank uh, all of the Mount Carmel individuals who uh, served uh, uh, this evening. I wanna especially thank uh, Brenda Rines for the uh, flyers that she put out, did an excellent job. And of course, she works with all of the Western New York, New York churches to make sure that, that we are okay. And just wanna thank the pastors that support this effort. And may God bless you as we sign off tonight. And we hopefully will see you again on next month. And we will also send out flyers at that time to make you aware of it. May God bless you as you let your light shine in this dark world. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Good night, Amen. everyone. Have good a good night. night. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again for joining us. Amen. Good night. Good night. God bless. Bye now.